Hello, it's Scott Manley here. With Starliner delayed once again, Dragon is the US's primary way to space. So uses what Russia uses, but we've never really talked about Shenzhou, which is the Chinese uh, crew vehicle. And while many people like to dismiss Shenzhou as a copy of Soyuz, it's a more capable vehicle. It incorporated a number of features before Soyuz, and it's larger. China's plans to put a human in space really started back in the 1960s, early 1970s, with the Shugang-1 project. And that was going to be a two-person capsule very similar to the Gemini spacecraft. But that project was cancelled due to lack of funding. But what did get funded and developed was reconnaissance satellites, which had to return their photographic film to the ground in re-entry capsules. So they developed the technology to run, recover stuff from space on target, and that would give them important experience in understanding what was needed to recover humans from space. So fast forward to the mid-1980s, and there's lots of stuff going on in space. Uh, the USA has the Space Shuttle, a revolutionary recoverable space vehicle. Soviet Union is still flying Soyuz, but it has a space station. Even Europe is developing the Hermes space plane. And so China has a bunch of scientists getting together, trying to figure out, you know, strategic directions for the country's, you know, scientific development. And one thing that comes out of this is something called Project 863. And the two main parts of this are the proposals by the scientists that China should develop a space station and a vehicle to carry crew to it. So proposals were sought from various institutions and 11 were submitted, I think six were shortlisted, and I think five of those were for space planes and only one was for a traditional space capsule design. Now, the reason for the preponderance of space planes was that that's where a lot of engineers thought that spacecraft development was going. After all, the US had built like three different space capsules and finally had this amazing space shuttle that could do everything. And Russia was developing and China felt that this was going to be a 21st century project and they didn't want to be the one country that was launching a space capsule that landed under parachute well, the rest of the world was flying fancy hypersonic space planes. They didn't want to be perceived to be behind the curve. But it was well understood that a capsule design would be much easier to develop. In fact, it would be necessary to develop such a thing as a lifeboat for a space station. Furthermore, all these space planes would require extensive development of boosters, whereas for a capsule, they could use the Long March 2E, which was well into development. And so initially these proposals were ultimately rejected by leadership, but there was changes, politics, and eventually it got authorization to proceed. And the design they went with was something very similar to a Soyuz. That is a spacecraft that has three major components. In the center, you have the descent and re-entry capsule where the humans are, they are in it for launch, they are in it for landing. On the rear, you have a service module, and on the front, you have the orbit module. That's a bit of space where the crew can get up, stretch their legs, have dinner, and of course, use the toilet. Now, US designs, they only use two parts. They have the service module and then the crew module. But one reason the US is able to do this is because its rockets were wider and therefore they could build a fatter capsule. When the Soviets designed Soyuz, they were still going to use the R-7 rocket, the same rocket that had been used to launch Sputnik and Laika and, of course, Gagarin and Vostok. They didn't make that any wider, so they had to make their spacecraft longer. And if they made the pressurized area longer, that made it harder to do re-entry. So by dropping a bunch of their pressurized volume, it meant they only had to have a small part handle re-entry. Long March 2 was similarly quite a narrow rocket, so it made sense for China to go this route as well. And so yeah, it was definitely heavily inspired by Soyuz. In particular, the shape of the cap, the descent capsule, is almost identical. And that's one part where aerodynamics matter, and so going with what was a known quantity was probably a good decision. And while China hadn't had great diplomatic relationships with the Soviet Union, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the former Soviet scientists and engineers were more than happy to start out offering technical advice in exchange for hard currency. So there were a number of deals which involved the exchange of physical pieces of hardware, which helped solve a lot of the problems in developing the spacecraft. But these weren't incorporated directly, these were reverse engineered, redeveloped, and Chinese versions created. 
So definitely there was a lot of copying going on, but on the other hand, Shenzhou is absolutely a better spacecraft than Soyuz. For a start, it's 10% bigger. The Long March 2F is a more capable rocket, enabling it to launch a, a heavier spacecraft. You can see that the uh, orbit module is stretched quite a bit, providing a fair amount of extra space. Shenzhou was developed in the 1990s, and therefore it started out with a fully digital control system. Whereas Soyuz only recently went fully digital. Indeed, in the early days of the space station, they still had the mechanical rotating globe, like globus map system, that cosmonauts would use to figure out where they were, where and where they were going to land. Another important difference is the reaction control thrusters for the descent module. So both spacecraft use hypergolic prop uh, propellants for the service module while in orbit, but on the Soyuz. The descent module uses high test peroxide, which is much less toxic than the hydrazine based propellants. Whereas on Shenzhou, they use a hydrazine monopropellant, so it's uh, you know a little more toxic, I guess. And Shenzhou engineers developed a new feature which had not been seen on Soyuz. They made the orbit module a separate spacecraft which could remain in space in its own right with the uh, Soyuz, it was just dropped in space and it would eventually burn up. In this case, it had its own solar panels, its own attitude control system. They attached a pallet of experiments to the front and it could continue to operate for months after the crew had returned home. So after years of development, the first launch of Shenzhou was in November of 1999. At this point, Shenzhou wasn't finished. A number of the subsystems were not fully operational. And this was really more a test of the launch vehicle, the Long March 2F, which by now had reached the status of uh, being human rated or whatever passes for human rated in the Shenzhou program. And the flight was successful. Uh, it completed 14 orbits. It returned and landed in Inner Mongolia. The main payload was a batch of seeds, which you know were returned and processed. And the landing systems fully operated, bringing it down safely so that the capsule was recovered. And so with one successful flight on the book, they continued working on the spacecraft, uh, finishing up the rest of the systems. And they were confident enough to put a live crew, albeit an animal crew, on Shenzhou 2. Yes, on board there was a monkey, a dog, and a rabbit. And uh, the launch happened in January 9th, 2001, and they spent seven days in orbit. This mission also featured a bunch of other science experiments which were launched, and the service module included an experiment in front of it, which many people believe to be uh, an electronic intelligence satellite. And so this spent over six months in orbit. It finally uh, was commanded to deorbit in August of that year. The descent module, of course, had immediately headed home, and it performed a flawless deorbit and a re-entry sequence right up until the point where it was supposed to deploy its parachute, and that didn't work. It was over a decade before this was actually confirmed, but I gather it hit the ground hard enough it would have killed anything inside. This capsule split open, a fire started, and some of the contents did actually survive because they were thrown clear. This piece of mail that flew is the only example I can find, and you can see in the top right it is slightly singed. Shenzhou 3 was then another test flight, and importantly, it included the launch escape system with the escape tower and the grid fins for steering. It spent a week on orbit, demonstrated a couple of orbit changes, and then touched down successfully, again leaving the orbit module in space for over six months with an electronics intelligence payload. And the final uncrewed test flight was Shenzhou 4. That was late December 2002. It landed in early January 2003. This flight also verified all the communication ships around the world. And so later in 2003, they were ready to launch a person. So the launch happened on 15th October 2003. It was not broadcast live. The re-entry and landing was not broadcast live. It wasn't until after the flight that we found that it was indeed, it did indeed have crew on board, making China the third nation to launch a you know, people to space under it, using its own technology. And that person was Lieutenant Colonel Yang Liwei, who of course became a huge celebrity in China. He spent just under a day in orbit before returning home safely. And these days, I believe he is still director of China's human spaceflight program, which means he's in charge of Shenzhou and Tiangong. 
So this was still very much a test flight. And uh, as a precaution, he wore the pressure suit for the whole flight. He, he was wearing diapers underneath. And I believe that when interviewed about his time on uh, Shenzhou 5, he said, better not to piss in diaper. Baby doesn't like it. Neither does an adult. The landing was also a little rough and apparently he bit his lip and he still has a scar there. That was a small problem in a very big and important mission for China. Now, a word on the suit, by the way, it is basically a direct copy of the so-called spacesuit. They bought a couple and then pretty much took them apart, figured out what all the pieces were, and then figured out how to build their own domestic suits. So the flight of Shenzhou 6 would be in October 2005, and this time it had a crew of two. And this would be an almost five day flight, so they were allowed to actually change out of their spacesuits and hang out in the orbit module. And then it would be three more years before Shenzhou 8 launched and it, the focus of its mission was going to be an EVA. So the, one of the nice things about the design of both Shenzhou and Soyuz is that there is a hatch between the descent module and the orbit module. And so you can use the orbit module as an airlock. And that's what they did. They had uh, one of the three crew members was, you know, in regular suit in the descent module. And then they had two of the crew performing an EVA. Now, this was the first test of the Phytan spacesuit. This was also a reverse engineered copy of the Russian suit, the Orlan. And this was done with Russian cooperation. The China bought a number of suits, not just like orbit EVA suits, but also training suits for like neutral buoyancy conditions and uh, other stuff like that. And they basically took them apart, figured out how to build them, and they modernized them as well. I believe the Phytan suit could arguably be, be better than the Orlan suit that is currently used on the Russian segment of the International Space Station. And indeed, for this very first EVA, one of the members was wearing a Russian Orlan suit, and you can tell that his one is slightly different because it has an extra pane of glass in the, the top of the helmet so he can look straight up. It also is a slightly darker color, and notably, he basically stayed inside the orbit module because he was primarily there for if there was an emergency. If they discovered a problem with that suit, they wanted to make sure they had a known good suit there to handle the emergency. And then it would be a couple more years before Shenzhou 8 flew. And it had the final major modification to the design. It had the docking adapter on the front because this mission was an uncrewed mission to the newly launched Tiangong-1 space station. The purpose was, of course, to verify the proximity operations, the approach, the docking, make sure the system worked where, without potentially putting any crew at risk. So this launched on 31st October 2011, and a couple of days later, it successfully docked with Tiangong Station, stayed docked for 12 days, and then undocked again before redocking. Now, the docking port is another massive change from Soyuz. Soyuz uses a probe and drogue mechanism, uh, whereas uh, Shenzhou uses a like a petal based system, which is bigger, heavier, more complex, but it's the same design which is used on the International Space Station. This design was originally developed for the Buran spacecraft, but of course that never ended up docking to anything. The Space Shuttle then adopted it for Shuttle Mir, and uh, it was adapted over time into what is now the International Docking Standard. The system used for navigating the spacecraft is also completely independent of what was developed for Soyuz, because of course the original uh, Kursk docking system was developed by Ukraine and Russia's early attempts to replace it resulted in a Progress spacecraft crashing into the Mir space station. Shenzhou does not appear to have the periscope that we see on Soyuz, which is used for the crew to be able to see ahead. It has cameras instead. And now that we have a steady rotation of Shenzhou spacecraft visiting Tiangong space station, there's another feature which I caught, which uh, the Soyuz doesn't have. And if you look very carefully at the image on the right there, you'll notice the other previous spacecraft, which is docked, has its solar panels rotated at 90 degrees. So the panels are on a gimbal, which allow them to rotate to point at the sun. That is not a capability that Soyuz has. So right now we have Shenzhou 18 docked to the station. They're replacing or they're cycling them every uh, six months. 
But earlier this year, China gave a name to its successor, the Mengzhou, which will be the spacecraft that's supposed to take China's astronauts to the moon. There already have been a pair of test flights of hardware. In 2016, there was a subscale version launched on the Long March 7, and 2020, a Long March 5B launched a full-sized version for uh, on-flight orbit uh, testing. The second test showed that they were interested in lunar return trajectories because it raised the orbit up to an apogee of about 8,000 kilometers so that when it descended, it hit the atmosphere at about 9 kilometers per second with significantly more energy uh, to test that heat shield. If China is serious about putting humans on the moon by uh, 2030, they're going to have to have uh, many more test flights in the coming years. But for now, they have Shenzhou, and it is perfectly capable of transferring their crew to their space station. And while it may look like Soyuz, it is definitely its own thing with its own capabilities. And uh, it is also objectively better. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.